So hello, my name is uh, Brian Belinsky. I'm the president of the Slovak American Society of Washington, D.C., and we'd like to welcome you to our presentation this evening with the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library. It's great to see a large virtual audience joining us here today. I'd kindly request everyone to mute their microphones and keep them muted through the presentation. During the presentation, feel free to use the chat function to ask questions of our presenters. At the conclusion of the formal presentation, the questions in the chat will be answered by our speakers. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I would like to mention a few upcoming SASW activities. Our genealogy and conversation groups are starting up soon. Please visit our website, dcslovaks.org, for more information on these activities. I would like to remind our current members to renew their memberships for 2021 and to encourage those who are attending our events for the first time to consider becoming a member. The NCSML is an important institution in the Slovak culture, Slovak culture of this country, and I'm sure many of you joining us this evening have a special connection to it. Tonight, we have three speakers from the NCSML joining us. President and CEO, Dr. Cecilia Rokusek, curator, Stephanie Cohn, and librarian, Dave Mulena. Stephanie will talk to us about the museum's collections and holdings and give us a inside look at current exhibitions and a sneak peek into future ones. Dave will provide an in-depth look into the library's collections and discuss the services provided by the library staff. Dr. Rokusek will discuss how the NCSML has survived three major disasters in the past 12 years and how change came much earlier than anticipated. And with that, I'll, I'll turn the floor over to uh, Dr. Rokusek. Thank you so much, Brian. Dobra večer. Vítame na vaše Národní České Slovenské muzeum a knihovna. It's a pleasure uh, for me, and I said it in our native tongue, welcome to your a National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And I'm just going to take a few minutes to talk a bit about this museum and how, as Brian said, we have survived three disasters. Uh, this beautiful building that you see in front of you uh, opened up in 1995, and it was dedicated by the three presidents at that time of the United States, President Clinton, President Havel of the Czech Republic, and President Kovac of Slovakia. And it was in 1992, prior to that, dedicated and uh, recognized by uh, the U.S. Congress as the only national uh, Czech and Slovak museum and library for the country. So we are like the Narodní Museum in Bratislava and like the Narodní Museum in uh, Prague. So the three of us share that sort of one a common bond is that we are the national museums for the preservation of our uh, cultures and for the education of all people. So this building, um, I'm the third president. I've really only been here two years, and the past year was kind of one that uh, I don't know how to consider it, but I think what it did is it forced us to think five or 10 years down the future as an example of this virtual meeting we're having today. Uh, this is something we might have been doing five or 10 years down the road, but we're doing it already. So it did that. We had a disaster in 2008, the Great Flood, in which we moved this building up uh, to higher ground and actually increased the size significantly of the building. And um, then under my clock of two years, uh, we've had two disasters, both in one year, the pandemic, which we're all be, being affected by, excuse me, the pandemic. And then in on August 10th, we had a, a horrific um, uh, derecho called, uh, it's, I had to look it up too, what it meant, but it's winds of uh, uh, une unexpected winds com coming with little notice. And we had sustained winds for almost an hour of 115 miles per hour. And the whole city, we lost about 65% of our trees and about 90% of our structures, including our museum and bell tower, uh, were all affected um, by this derecho. So that's how we look. 
And like I said, we moved to higher ground and officially opened now in 2012. So if we look at the date of uh, 1995, when it was dedicated, we are celebrating now our 25th anniversary. Next slide, please. So what we did in the past year and a half is we really looked at our mission and I wanna pick out some important, this is our new mission. We want to preserve, present and transcend our stories. Um, and through experiences and active engagement. So this is a good example and a special thanks to the Slovak American Society of DC for uh, bringing this uh, to you, is that we want to bring to you our experiences, our stories, ideally that you can come here, but also that we can do it virtually. And we like to think of ourselves as being the National Czech and Slovak Museum and Library, but we want to bring our stories to all cultures so that you can learn from us. And each year we do the naturalization ceremony for new citizens in Iowa. And um, I've been lucky enough to speak the last two years for that uh, special occasion. And I always say, welcome to your museum. And uh, most of the people are not Czech or Slovak that are new citizens but I want them to know that from our rich stories that they will learn from the stories of immigration, the stories of the fight for democracy and the importance of keeping uh, us in a free and democratic society. So we talk about our rich history, but we want people to celebrate their own through the stories of our rich culture. Next slide, please. So our vision then is to be a leader and we've added this lifelong learning. We do a lot with children. In a normal year, we'll have over 3,000 children coming through our building for educational opportunity and, and learning experiences. But we're going to be doing a lot with our long-term care facilities. We're doing a lot for uh, active young adults and for middle-aged folks. So we really want to be um, a leader in lifelong learning education so that uh, one of my big areas that I really want to promote as president and CEO is the preservation of our cultures. Um, I'm a fourth generation Czechoslovak and for me uh, my culture is everything and I think a lot of third fourth fifth and sixth generation people forget maybe that connection to their culture so we really want to bring that cultural connection to everyone and, and to help people through self-discovery realize that they they are Slovak and so we want them to relate to their stories their grandparents great-grandparents and how they struggled and had maybe my great-grandparents lived in a, in a covered wagon for two years in South Dakota and we want those stories to live on for future generations so uh, that is our vision um, we want to bring our cultures we want to to all people and to people of all ages and so that in 50 years 100 years we are still here and vibrant and very proud of who we are next slide please so we developed a new strategic plan and um, I just want to briefly highlight a couple of strategies that I think you'll be interested in as a an organization that is, is committed to uh, preserving our culture and pre preserving our ideals of freedom and democracy as well as, as our rich traditions. So we want to be the national leader and, and I commend the Slovak Americans for uh, their work in um, at DC for reaching out to us and as a result of our connections working together we can promote each other more. And so we can share through our media, you can share through your media, and we really see us as the epicenter or flagship to work with all organizations throughout the country uh, so that our footprint is never lost, our cultural footprint. So we really see us as, as that. And again, I wanna commend Brian and Helen for uh, reaching out to see how we can work together more closely. Uh, we uh, are, have outstanding exhibits, outstanding programs. Uh, we work very closely with our high schools um, and outreach initiatives where um, a, you know, a couple of years ago we built a Berlin Wall to teach about democracy. And so, um, uh, and Stephanie is going to give you a, a very good overview of the exhibits that she has planned and some very exciting ones this year and, and in the future. Uh, we uh, do want to become an educational leader, and I think museums have evolved, and especially given the pandemic, into being much more closely united with the school systems, and to not only be a place you come and look, but a place that you learn from, and a place that you can take uh, stories from to teach other generations. So we uh, education will continue, our exhibits, programs, and education will continue with our library to be the foundation of who we are. 
clearly uh, we are in Cedar Rapids and people will often ask, why are we in Cedar Rapids? We're really in the center of America. And if we look at, at you know, the immigration patterns, clearly uh, Slovaks uh, came to the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Ohio areas, uh, Chicago, and uh, more of the Czechs came to the central part of the United States. But you also had Slovaks immigrating to Chicago and Wisconsin and uh, Minnesota. So we really are in the center of the universe, so to say, for America uh, to bring those cultures together. At one time, uh, Cedar Rapids in the early 1900s, uh, there were about 28% of the population uh, came from uh, the that Austrian-Hungarian Empire that uh, we have, uh, it was uh, Czechoslovakia. So we uh, clearly have a, a strong tie here in, in most, so when you go through a phone book, um, the names all resonate to our cultural backgrounds. And um, one of the things that we are doing in the last two years is expanding our partnerships uh, with colleges and universities throughout the Czech and Slovak republics uh, to bring students and scholars here uh, because it's important that they learn about the immigration of their ancestors. And uh, we just had a PhD student here last year. Uh, I guess it's now in 2019, who was getting his PhD in history, uh, Czech history. And we've had um, students uh, from um, another student getting uh, his degree in, in uh, actually filmmaking and did a great job with us in, in doing some things for the museum. So we are working with Comenius University. We're working with Machabella University. We're working with Olomouc and Palatsky, and we're working also with Charles University. And then finally, we need to establish a strong financial base to assure that we're here for the long-term future. Our museum, being a national museum, is here uh, for um, all generations. So we need to uh, continue to do the good work that has been uh, laid in the past and we continue to do, but we need to, as we um, go from the 25 years to our next 50 years, we need to make sure that we have a strong foundation. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have identified the next 25 years, uh, if we uh, our journey from the silver to the gold, and if you think of those steps as our journey, uh, this is the front of our museum now, uh, and that we hope you'll all come to visit. But we uh, are 25 years old now, and in four years we're going to be 50. Now the math doesn't work that way. But it was in 1974 when the early visionaries got together and said, you know, we need to preserve our culture. And so they started putting exhibits in storefronts and banks. And, and that was the early days that really laid the foundation to build this beautiful building then in, in 1995 and have it dedicated and to be recognized in 92 as a national center. So um, that's our story. And we are right now celebrating the silver and we're certainly with the uh, pandemic we were delayed a bit, and with the trade show, we were delayed a bit, but we are all a resilient culture, and I think uh, our strength and who we are has allowed us to really rise above and to make sure that our journey from the silver to the gold will be a strong one uh, for many, many, many generations to come. And with that, I will turn things over to um, uh, my dear colleague, uh, Stephanie Cohen. Stephanie is um, our curator, and uh, Stephanie um, has been here. She's been a real foundation here over 20 years, as, as Dave Molina, who is our head librarian. He's been here, I think, the longest, 23 years. Uh, so I'm the newcomer, but these two people really have established a strong foundation. And I will turn things now over to Stephanie. It's all yours. Hi, thanks for tuning in. I guess we're all tuning in here. Um, Eck, as Cecilia said, I've been here for 21 years, and um, I think we'll talk a little bit about uh, current and then upcoming exhibits and then a little bit about collections. So we have um, about six exhibit spaces with, within the museum. And so I certainly can't talk about all of the exhibits that we're having going on because we have probably 12 to 15 per year, but I'll talk about a couple of the major ones. So right now, um, our two temporary exhibits are Formed in Fire, the Joyce Anderson Glass Collection, which closes April 11th, and Stitching History from the Holocaust. So next slide, please. It's Formed in Fire, the Joyce Anderson Glass Collection is, is our collection from a local supporter of the museum. She and her parents supported the museum for, for many years, and Joyce is a prolific glass collector. So she's given us about 700 items um, 
so far from her collection, and that's certainly not all of it. So about 200 are on display now. It's just all different kinds of glass. She just buys what she likes, and she's got a lot of diff different um, pieces to her collection. Next slide. So here's royal ducks. She has a lot of beautiful royal ducks pieces. And, and these kind of exhibits, when we do things with our glass and porcelain collection, it really uh, strikes a chord with a lot of our visitors. That's kind of what their heritage means to them is that that beautiful representation of it. So they're always really happy to see glass and porcelain. Next slide. And then she also has some um, jewelry in her collection as well, you know, mostly made of glass and crystal. So uh, kind of a, a nice variety. Next slide. And then this piece, actually, she just gave us after the exhibit opened. We got this, I think, just a few days before Christmas. And it's a really interesting piece. It's um, uranium glass. So it's it's kind of that funny yellowish green color because it was a color. Uh, the glass was made with uranium, which um, during the Cold War was kind of hard to get to create this glass. So it is somewhat rare. And then a uh, a person who used to be the manager at the Eggerman factory started his own glass works and bought some of these uranium blanks and then etched them with with the red stain and the etching. So it's really a very unusual uh, and rare piece. We're really excited to get it, even though the exhibit had already opened. I made a little case and put it on display because I just wanted to share it with everyone. Next slide. So the other uh, temporary gallery that we have going on right now is Stitching History from the Holocaust. So uh, unlike the glass exhibit, which is our own collection, this is a, an exhibit that we borrowed from another museum. And this is from the Jewish Museum, Milwaukee. And it's a really uh, interesting exhibit about uh, a Czech, a Czech uh, couple from Prague who attempted to get out of Czechoslovakia um, as World War II started. Next slide. And um, there's, you can kind of see them there in the picture, Paul and Hetty Sternod. And what they did was uh, Paul wrote to his cousin Alvin in Milwaukee, and he wrote letters asking for some kind of sponsorship so that this they could get out of um, Czechoslovakia because they, you know, it was getting really bad for for Jewish people at that time in the in 1938. So Paul wrote to Alvin, and he also sent uh, dress designs that his wife Hetty had created, hoping that her talent. Uh, and potential for work in the U.S. would would sort of buy them a, a ticket to the United States. Next slide. So unfortunately, they did not get out. They ended up going to Terezin and then on to Auschwitz and were killed. But the dress designs lived on. Um, the designs and the letters were put in somebody's basement in Milwaukee and found decades later. So someone brought it to the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee and for a long time the designs and the letters were part of their permanent exhibit and then a visitor, I'm not sure how long ago it was, maybe 10 years ago, said why don't you actually get these dresses created. So that's what the museum did and they worked with the Milwaukee Repertory Theater and had the dresses made from Hetty's designs. Next slide. So there's uh, eight dresses in the exhibit and a lot of accompanying uh, letter reproduction and text panels. And so it's it's kind of highlighting um, Hetty's story as a, as a designer and her beautiful dresses, but it's also talking about the loss of the loss of, of human potential that the Holocaust uh, cost the, the world. There's so many things that were never created and never discovered and never realized because of of the loss of, of human life. So it's it's a really um, well done exhibit. I'm so glad we were able to borrow it from, from Milwaukee. Next slide. So now we'll do upcoming exhibits. Okay, next slide. <laughs> that one's not very informative. Uh, we're, our big excitement for the year of 2021 is Treasures of Slovakia. So we're working with the National Museum in Bratislava and they're creating an original exhibition for us. It will open May 21st and go the rest of the year. And it's going to um, kind of feature four uh, key areas of Slovak history and culture. And it's all put together by the staff at the Slovak National Museum. Um, we're working with them, but they're really in charge of what's going to be in it and, and writing the stories that they want to tell. And I mean, of course, these artifacts have never been to the United States that are, that are going to come here. So we're pretty excited about it. Next slide. So here's just uh, some pictures that they have sent us of some of the types of items they plan to include in the exhibit. Next slide. And I don't have a lot of information about what they are, but they really 
they are so beautiful and interesting. This is some kind of musical instrument that's going to be discussed. Next slide. And this is an example of art. And this one I was told is called Two Women and it's by Martin Benka and it's from 1933. So that, that I had some information about. So we're gonna have um, natural history, next slide, um, fine art, natural history, folk art, and um, I'm not sure what the fourth topic is, maybe just, maybe just ancient history because I really had wanted to, uh, there to be a focus on kind of the older history since in America, you know, 200 years is old, but obviously in Europe, a thousand is, is, is pretty cool for Americans to see something like that. So we're looking forward to that exhibit. And next slide, um, we're having uh, toward the end of 2021, we're having the Slovak headdresses from the Bain Sinsebo collection. Uh, Helene Sinsebo has got the largest collection of Slovak textiles in the United States. And she also collects uh, some Moravian and Czech. And either, these are some examples of Slovak headdresses. You can see the variety of them. It's gonna be very, very interesting. And that's another topic. You know, people, some people really like our glass exhibits. There's other people that if we have anything like about textiles or folk dress, they're there. They really wanna see that. And that's important to them too. So we try to, can't have it all the time every year, but when we do have it, we get a lot of really excited people coming to see it. So we're really looking forward to highlighting Helene's, you know, headdresses. Next one. Another uh, topic we're going to have, this is another traveling exhibit. It's Jacob Reese, How the Other Half Lives. And uh, Reese was an immigrant in the 19th century in, in New York City. He became a photojournalist, which was not a thing really before he did it. Um, and so he photographed immigrants mostly on the Lower East Side of New York City, where they worked and where they lived. Next slide. And then he used his images to, he actually did lantern slide show uh, talks and presentations and lectures around, um, really around the, the country, highlighting people, so people would know what it was like for, for these immigrants and how they lived. So this is not a Czech or Slovak specific topic. This is more like all uh, mostly European immigrants in, in the late 19th century to the United States. So it's a really well done traveling exhibit. So. Um, we're really ex excited to have that. And that's only three of our upcoming exhibits. As I said, we're, we'll have at least 10 in 2021, but that's kind of the three that I chose to tell you about. So moving on to the next slide, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the artifact collection because that's kind of my department is exhibits and artifacts. So this is, um, I certainly won't read this to you, but this is our kind of our basic collections policy where we're pretty much collecting Czech and Slovak items, material culture, folk and fine art, um, not too much American unless it's real specific that Czech and Slovak Americans used it. We really try to stick to, to Czech and Slovak things and we like things with a good story. So, you know, I'm a sucker for a good story of somebody escaping from the communists or something, you know, that, then that artifacts can be really interesting to me. Next slide. So kind of a brief overview of the collection. We have over 19,000 items now and um, growing, growing all the time. About 6,000 of those are textiles. When I started 21 years ago, we didn't have 19,000 items. I, I can't remember how many we had. It might've been about 10,000, but half the items then were textiles. So um, it, it has grown in other directions now, even though we do love our textiles. And about 200 of the textiles make up full croya. The rest are either pieces or it's a tablecloth or uh, a piece of embroidery or something like that. But we do have quite a large collection of, of full uh, folk dress, which we're very, very proud of. And we always have at least 12 on display in our permanent exhibit at, at any given time because people really want to see that. Next slide. These are some images from our collection storage. You can kind of see there's a box with some uh, textiles kind of folded up in tissue in it. Uh, there's shelving. Most of those boxes on the shelves do contain textiles. Um, everything is cataloged, photographed. Uh, we know the location of everything with our computerized database. The other is a, the other picture is some cabinet doors that are open to show. We keep um, glassware, perfume bottles, porcelain in these uh, cabinets, so you can just open the door and kind of see see what you see what you got going there. So it's pretty fun to open up the cabinet door and see what you're going to see. Next slide. And a way that you can connect with our artifact collection, if you can't actually come here to see the exhibits, where probably about 3% of our collections on display at any one time, so you're never gonna see everything. 
but we do have an online artifact collection that right now has about um, nearly 4,200 items on it, which is pretty impressive. Our um, collections manager, Tricia Bender, is in charge of that database. So you can go to our website and under exhibits, you'll find the online artifacts collection and you can go through and look at pictures and see descriptions of, of the artifacts. And I don't know if we'll ever get all the pieces on there, but we're just working through it, um, just adding as many as we can every week. Some more should probably get added. And um, then that's a good way for people to be able to, to look, look at artifacts. It's helpful for um, people doing research or for students. So even if you can't come here, you can kind of connect with the artifact collection. And that is what I was going to tell you about. I think it's time for the library for Dave Milena. Thank you. Um, so continuing with the library or the collections overview, we'll just kind of go into what we offer in the library. Um, so we're, we, we uh, are not just books. We have uh, materials in, in many different formats, books, periodicals, phono records, archival materials, oral history interviews, and it's a multilingual collection as well. Um, and so I would say probably the, the, the pro most common language we have in, in our materials here is Czech followed by Slovak and then English and then German. So next slide. Um, and so we cover a lot of different subjects here as well, um, all related to Czech and Slovak history and culture. Uh, basically history and politics, community histories, and so forth. You, know, you can go down the list there. We try to be comprehensive in, in all things that, that deal with Czech and Slovak history and culture. So um, next slide. And then just by looking at some numbers here, um, you know, we've, uh, uh, back in 2005, we, uh, we had 10,000 cataloged items. Um, that of course went down because of uh, the flood of 2008. Um, but we have exceeded that now. We have 11,000, uh, nearly 11,500 items that are cataloged. Um, and then uh, phonograph records are, are a large part of our collection. And then um, DVDs and CDs. So next slide. And then I'm, I'm, we're, we're gonna go through kind of a walking tour of our library facility here. This is what it looks like going into the library. You can see it's not just you know, library shelves, it's a multi-purpose space. Um, the, the, we have a small gallery space, uh, you can see on the right here, right now, that, that's featuring uh, Josef Lada prints that have a holiday theme to them. And next slide. This gives you a little better uh, shot there of uh, the other items we have in the reading room. These are largely English language materials or bilingual materials. Um, so, um, that's what most of our people that come in are looking for. And then um, next slide. Um, we have our closed stacks area. And this is where we store our um, foreign language materials. Uh, so that's our foreign language books. Also have uh, uh, periodicals uh, stored in that section. Next slide. Um, and then we do have archival materials. And so this section here uh, uh, is part of our archival uh, collection. And next slide. Uh, and those white boxes there are all our phonograph records. So that's, uh, you know, uh, a, again, a significant part of our collection here and reflective of the, you know, the musical nature of uh, Slovaks and Czechs. So next slide. And then what I want to do next is to walk through uh, what we have available online, since that's the most readily uh, accessible means of, of understanding what we have available here uh, outside of visiting us and talking with library staff. So that's the landing page for our, um, for our library section of our website. And if you go to the next slide, um, we have a, a rundown of what we collect. And then in the next slide, we, we'll just kind of go through our tabs. Um, so this is the collections that you can search. Um, so we feature online catalog, digital library, finding aids and oral histories. And on the next slide, we'll have uh, um, the, our next tab would be dealing with genealogy and uh, if you advance next, um, you can see how we have it organized. We actually that red bar up there, it's, it's our um, guide to doing Czech and Slovak uh, genealogy. Um, if you click on that link, that'll pull up a PDF 
document that we uh, prepared uh, that offers tips and you know uh, suggestions on getting started with doing genealogy. Uh, the other uh, pull down slides that we have below there are organized basically by uh, ethnic groups. So we have Czech, Slovak, Carpathian Rusin, Jewish, other genealogy resources, uh, and then uh, other Czech and Slovak uh, genealogy organizations that are active. Uh, next slide. And then um, people, you know, uh, uh, both Stephanie and I get donation offers on a regular basis. So this uh, uh, kind of walks people through about what to expect uh, uh, or what we're looking for, for um, you know, donations of library materials. Um, next slide. Uh, that's uh, we're. Uh, I have a colleague, Leroy is our uh, Leroy Bradway is our uh, library cataloger, and we too are the ones that you will encounter if you visit us or email us or call us. Um, you know, we provide reference service as well. So, um, and that might be a good. Let's see, and then external links. Um, we're growing our our links to other things about the Czech and Slovak American communities. Um, so that first uh, pull down tab there is Czech, Slovak, and Rusin fraternal organizations. Um, and the other one is Czech, Slovak, and Slavic uh, festivals. Um, so I encourage you to explore those just, uh, and we'll be adding more content in this section. Uh, so look for more to come. And this might, let's look at the next slide there. Um, I'm gonna take this opportunity too to talk about some of the services that Leroy and I provide um, so, um, you know, I encourage you, if you have any questions regarding, you know, Slovak or Czech history, culture, uh, genealogy, um, to contact us. Um, so both Leroy and I, you know, have been working here for several years and are quite familiar with our collections, as well as those of other uh, collections that are out there. Uh, there are other um, universities, uh, certainly the Library of Congress, uh, that have, um, you know, collections as well. So we do a lot of referrals to other organizations uh, based on the individual's needs. Like today, I got an uh, inquiry uh, from somebody who's looking for translation work. We do not provide translations here. However, we do refer people to others that, that do. And then there was a fellow looking for genealogy uh, uh, assistance um, who uh, wanted to do some like heritage tourism. So I gave a referral to some researchers in Czech Republic in this case. So um, we do, you know, advise a lot of people on, on various things and, and, you know, either point them to resources that we have or ones that are available elsewhere. So um, starting with, and, and then looking at resources, uh, um, we do have an online catalog. This is where you look for books and periodicals in our collection. And if you go to the next slide, we do have a digital library. So this is where we hold our digitized content. And so there's a lot of different sections there. Um, and if you go to the next one, um, finding aids. So these are for non-book materials. It would be like uh, accessing information about our, what periodicals we hold or uh, a, a, a list of the phonograph records that we have in our collection. And in the next slide, um, in our oral history project. So uh, about 10 years ago, we engaged in a, uh, uh, actually two uh, oral history projects where we interviewed nearly, well, a little over 300 people who had emigrated from uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, especially during the Cold War, to understand their experience. Uh, so this was from 1948 to 1989, for the most part. And each individual that we interviewed had, you know, their own unique stories of sometimes, you know, emigrating or especially escaping the communist regime of Czechoslovakia. So those are uh, available in this section here, and I encourage you to to, uh, to explore those if you're interested in kind of Cold War era uh, or stories of freedom and identity. This is where you're going to find those stories. Next slide. So, and I think this is where uh, Cecilia is going to take it over. Okay, thank you so much, David. And um, we put this slide up there to sort of, as we begin to put this all together, to show you uh, some of the other uh, work that we do 
from a, an academic and publishing perspective, we put out uh, our journal, which is called the Slovo, the NCSML Slovo. And I, I put this one up there uh, because our last issue was specifically on Treasures of Slovakia because we were to have it in the fall of 2020. But of course, we had to pivot and change it for later. But this is one of our, our prize journal pieces that we do twice a year. Um, and uh, for example, our next issue is going to be on the history of the museum. So each uh, uh, half year, we do a, a special journal. And then in between that, we do a, a newsletter public publication that we've added to. It's called the Most or Bridge, Most or Bridge. And so we wanted to tell you about that. Uh, this is available. All members do get um, the copies of the uh, Slovos twice per year and all publications that we do uh, in between. Uh, I was going to highlight what both uh, Stephanie and Dave said. Uh, each year in a non-pandemic year, we will impact about 60,000 uh, visitors or individuals that come for programs or events here. So um, in a normal year, we can figure to 60 to 70,000 people that we will impact. Certainly with virtual learning now, uh, we have the potential to impact even more. And I, I think that may be uh, coming down the road. Uh, as Stephanie so well um, outlined for you, our visiting uh, and, and changing exhibits, but our large, large permanent exhibit is entitled Faces of Freedom that really talks about our um, journey as immigrants and the Czech and Slovak stories through communism and uh, uh, beyond. So uh, I think that um, the Faces of Freedom is, is really a place always that people want to come. Uh, and that's where the Croy are, as well as the uh, historical stories and um, traditions of our culture. This year, we did something a little different for 21. Uh, because we do so much, we wanted, and we have a new strategic plan, we wanted to really focus on themes. So each year, we'll be focusing on themes that will be integrated throughout our exhibits, throughout our programs, and throughout, um, we have an award-winning store here that tries to highlight and complement our exhibits. Uh, through our store at one of the National Museum Store of the Year, and we're very proud of that. Uh, so this year's themes for 21 are um, democracy. So we'll be having a program each month on democracy. Our second theme is Treasures of Slovakia, which will be highlighted through our exhibits and programs. And our, our third theme is um, where we're really uh, going to be looking at um, the, uh, so democracy, uh, Czech and Slovak Jews. So democracy, um, Czech and Slovak Jews and treasures of Slovakia are the three themes that we have planned for 21. And the uh, Czech and Ju uh, Slovak Jewish story is something that we feel very is very important to us because of the fact that young people today um, do not even know what the Holocaust was. And yet the stories of Czechs and Slovak Jews uh, are oftentimes uh, important to history. So um, that's certainly where stitching history is a big part of that exhibit. And we'll be having programs around that. And then next year, we'll be coming out with uh, three more themes. So each year, we're going to try to, to stick to the three themes that integrate so that our students that come through, as well as our visitors, can begin to understand sort of the stories and the, the themes that, that are ancestors. And we say that we are uh, preserving history. We're celebrating the present, which is something we need to do, but we're also creating the future. So I think that's an important theme that we uh, try and um, to carry out, uh, preserving, celebrating, and really creating uh, the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, it, it, we are going to open this up to questions, but I do want to give you a couple of closing thoughts. Um, and, and both David and, and Stephanie uh, touched on that. Uh, collections. It's really important that if you know of, of you know, valuable collections, whether they be artwork, textiles, uh, books that Dave, you know, uh, approves or needs of, or music, uh, that you uh, preserve it. It's too many times, I think, uh, people will throw things away or not realize the importance and the value of this. So I encourage all of you to uh, make sure that we preserve our, our culture by making sure that collections or any artifacts that individuals have are not thrown away and that we can, because this is our national repository 
Uh, and in 2019, uh, we became an affiliate of the Smithsonian, which we're very proud of. Um, and that means that, you know, our quality and, and the kinds of work that our great staff do here um, it really is a, a mark, a seal of excellence. And I, before we close and before we open this up to questions, I'm sure many of you have, I would like to commend my executive assistant, Amanda Bartell, for being our, our wonderful, she's a museum professional and she really does a great job. So thank you for helping, uh, and Helen and Brian, certainly. So I'll turn things over uh, to you now, Brian. But I do have one slide yet, Amanda, that I want to leave you with before uh, we go, um, and then we'll go back to the questions. Avshita nashchivit velmi rari vasshivitame. So sometimes we want you to come to visit us, and if you look closely at this picture before we go into the question, this is a brand new mural that we have right side of our, our museum, uh, and it's Muka meets um, uh, Iowa is the title of the mural, but they asked for us to come and wear our kroya. So if you look at that picture uh, going from left to right, you'll see our Vice President for Development is in Akroy, our Director of Facilities is in Akroy, uh, Stephanie, our, our curator, is the next person in the Akroy, Amanda's in Akroy, I'm in my Zeplanske Kroy from Slovakia, uh, my better half is in his Zeplanske Kroy, and then we have our, our CFO. So we all got dressed up in Kroy uh, for that special event, and they were not from the collection, these were all from our own personal that we have. We do not take and wear Croy from our collections ever. Uh, these are personal Croy. So uh, when you come, we'll even wear them and we'll have collages for you. So Pshita Nashtivit Prosim, and we would be very happy to Velmi Radi Vasvitame. So please come and see us. So now I'll turn it back to you, Brian. Okay. Um... Well, it seems that everyone has been saving their uh, questions to ask in person here. There's nothing uh, current in the chat right now, so. Um. Um, there was one question about uh, movies um, and online viewing. Um, I guess that would go to Dave, maybe? That would be a wonderful thing, but there is that thing called copyright that we have to be very aware of. So um, I, I would refer you to certainly Netflix, but also there's a uh, uh, an organization in Chicago called Facets, F-A-C-E-T-S. Uh, actually, that was founded by a, a Czech immigrant, uh, Milo Stelik, who recently passed on. Actually, he somebody we interviewed for our oral history project several years ago. But um, they have uh, they specialize in a lot of foreign uh, films, so that might be another resource that that you could reach out to uh, for some of these you know more esoteric or obscure kind of things. Um, but um, but you know certainly contact me if you're looking for anything uh, in particular, or uh, and then you know if you want to explore what we have in our collection, certainly um, you can uh, um, use our online catalog. All those are cataloged at this point. That's what Leroy did during our, our shutdown period, he got caught up on, on cataloging all of our, our DVDs and CDs this year, so. I have a question for both Stephanie and Dave. Um, you are accepting donations of materials. What is the number one maybe category or type of material that each of you uh, would love to have donated? Well, um, Dave, I really like, uh, I really like things from the communist era because it's something we don't have a lot of in our artifact collection. We have a lot of folk dress and glass and porcelain and items that immigrants brought with them kind of pre-1920. So more of the later 20th century history is, is really kind of a place where I think our collection needs to grow. And um, honestly, believe it or not, um, marionettes and puppets, we have just a few in our collection and it's such an interesting part of Czech and Slovak culture both. I've always wanted, um, of some larger marionettes, especially, um, I think, uh, what's his name, Vodnik, the water man. I can't think of how to say his name in Slovak, but um, that's, you know, so I guess that's my secret wish is a, is a water man, <laughs> is a water man puppet, but, but lots of marionettes would be very interesting to have. 
on our end of the library, I'm always happy to receive Slovak American and, and Czech American materials that, that document that, that immigrant experience. And, you know, that goes back from the early days of immigration to even today. Um, so that's what I, you know, our, I, I see that is, is one of our primary uh, uh, collection development uh, uh, objectives here is to document that American experience. And so, and that, you know, again, those things are, are in the form of books, periodicals, uh, archival materials uh, uh, for defunct organizations. There, you know, there are lots of fraternal organizations that, that were active back in the day. Um, and, you know, so um, then there's phonograph records. We're still actively collecting those. So there's a lot of different things that, that we can use just for documenting that, that Czech and Slovak American experience here. So um, beyond that, um, you know, so, um, boy, that's uh, um, working with, uh, um, you know, other organizations to, to help identify, you know, what those organizations have would be, you know, I'm always interested in learning about what, what else is out there so that we can network with those uh, organizations and uh, again, work collaboratively so that we can preserve this history and culture. But, um, you know, looking at uh, other materials, uh, lots of people have uh, um, you know, books or things that were brought during the communist era <laughs> and, and like literature and everything. Actually, we have quite a bit of that. So uh, it's, it's, that's, those are, so there are certain things that we, we have an abundance of. Uh, I would say coffee table books or picture books that you, you find. Those are very popular items. So those are examples of items that, that we have an abundance. And so really um, we're collective selectively now. So there's other things that, that um, you know, kind of on the other thing, uh, other end of things where, um, you know, we're, we're trying to limit at this point. So, but if there's any question about what you may have, uh, certainly reach out to us, um, you know, because you know, what you may think would be just something that might not be of interest uh, actually could be. I'm always looking for ephemera to uh, things that, that like little playbills or, uh, um, you know, theater programs, those sort of things, um, you know, that, that are, have a one use function, but, you know, usually they get tucked away somewhere and forgotten. And then, you know, 50 years later, when somebody's downsizing, they pull them out and thought, oh, what's this? And then those are the things that I'm looking for because those oftentimes document events or uh, occasions uh, um, in, you know, Slovak American or Czech American uh, history that we want to preserve and, and recognize. Two things I just thought of as both of you are talking, um, and there was one comment, and Dave, maybe you can speak on that. I know that you're looking at albums. There was a question about if you want uh, record albums. And then Stephanie, um, the issue of a traveling exhibits. I think our uh, Slovak American Society of DC might be interested in our traveling exhibits that you have available. So you may want to talk a little bit about that, Steph. And Dave, you may want to talk about records. Well, phonograph records, uh, uh, I would say the ones that we're uh, uh, looking for in particular, ag again, those that were produced here in the United States by the, uh, the immigrants. Um, and so uh, those would be, you know, there's with the, the 78s, uh, those were largely, uh, I would say, record labels like uh, RCA Victor, Columbia, and so forth. And then during the vinyl age, that things really kind of exploded because that became much more accessible technology. And so then you've got, um, you know, smaller labels that are represented as well. So, and again, I would uh, add that, you know, we're geographically located here in the Midwest. And so, you know, our collection certainly re reflects that, that I would say it's pretty heavily, um, well, you know, well represented with Czech materials, less so than Slovak materials, which, you know, looking at the population density in the East, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Jersey, New York, um, you know, those things don't travel out here as much unless those people traveled here as well uh, through kind of internal migration. So again, you know, if um, 
If you have materials, uh, please give us some, um, you know, especially Slovak materials, please keep us in mind. Um, you know, those are an area of growth for us, for sure. Um, and Stephanie, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, we have, uh, for traveling exhibits, we developed some um, exhibits that are basically like uh, retractable panels. So they are uh, text and pictures. Most of them are six to eight panels. And these are available for people to borrow. The, the borrower has to pay for the shipping of them. There isn't any other fee. And they go out to festivals and things. We have a lot of them booked in the summer to go to various Czech and Slovak festivals around around the country or a library or a Sokol or some such organization might have them on display in their space for, you know, can be any length of time. Sometimes it's just a few weeks. So some of the topics that these are, um, we have one about Sokol, uh, World War One, a really interesting one based on that oral history project is called Leaving Czechoslovakia. And it's about people who left over various in various uh, parts at various times during the 20th century and why they left. Um, we have famous Czechs and Slovaks, which is kind of a fun one because it comes with a quiz. We have something on uh, the Velvet Revolution. So different topics of, of Czech and Slovak history and culture are kind of represented in those. And we try to try to put out a new one every year. It kind of just depends on some of our other projects. And then we also have a more extensive exhibit, The Travels, that's called Tragedy of Slovak Jews. And that's a bigger exhibit that's a couple of crates, and it's all about the Holocaust uh, in, in Slovakia. All right, we have a, a question from the audience of, the question is, do you, do you accept Slovak books? We do. Um, again, you know, it just depends on what those are. And, and typically how I approach it is that, um, you know, I, I do request, if possible, uh, to create a list of the books that include uh, uh, the, the author, the title, and the year of publication. And um, if that's not possible, um, certainly like pictures, of title pages will do as well. Um, so that helps us determine, you know, what the potential donor has and whether it is something that, you know, uh, uh, if there's a gap in our collection, we'll acquire it. If it's a duplicate, we'll probably decline it and then offer up also a, a suggestion of other places that may have a use for it. Uh, we, again, we do a lot of referrals here. Um, there are other, um, I would say universities and cultural organizations here in the U.S. that may be able to put those to good use. So, you know, I take that you know job of kind of the stewardship of these things pretty seriously. I don't want to see these things ended up in you know uh, uh, certainly in the dumpster or or you know in in goodwill or whatever. I want to find help people find a home for these. And if it you know if it's a duplicate for us, still um, we want to find those ensure that those materials, that cultural heritage is preserved in some way. So, you know, I, I'm happy to work with people, uh, um, you know, in, in helping find homes for these materials. Dave, do you also collect children's materials? Actually, we do. Um, so uh, we just received a nice, small, little, uh, unexpected uh, donation uh, just the other day. And so, um, and that goes from, you know, the stuff from, you know, uh, I would say the Czechoslovak era uh, back in, in um, you know, the 20s and 30s. There's some really wonderful graphic art during that time period, but also in the you know, more recent um, uh, uh, eras, there there are some really neat children's books as well. So it's not only for me, it's not only the fact that it's children's books, but also it's it's kind of a um, you know the art that is in, uh, often that accompanies the children's books is is I think equally important. I'm really glad you asked that question because I was looking, but I already gave my last copy away. Uh, during the pandemic, our um, uh, associate director in, in, in our outreach and innovation, who really takes care of our education programs, wrote a manual. 
It's actually a workbook for children and it's uh, uh, Czech and Slovak traditions for children. And it's a wonderful 50 page um, booklet that our bookstore sells. But what's important about that, I had several grandparents and parents saying to me, oh, this is great now and we're working at home and teaching our children at home uh, that this workbook is available. So if any of that one has an interest, uh, be sure to contact either me or or just you can order it online. But it's a, a good way because as Dave has articulated so well, um, we really, and in our mission now to uh, really work with all ages because we cannot forget our culture. We just must preserve it. And it's so interesting to hear grandparents say, well, my grandchild drew this or my grandchild did this puzzle uh, on Stefanik, for example. So we really want people to be able to connect and, and so that it's it lives on. And um, I think that um, that's really important. So I'm just going to point that out about that new uh, workbook that we did put together, that Sarah Henderson put together. So I had a question. Uh, is the library interested in acquiring uh, old photos that may depict some, I guess, significant uh, or some aspect of Slovak life in the new country or in the U.S.? Definitely, yes. Um, you know, I, I I would hope that you know we can acquire materials that document again that Czech and uh, Slovak American experience. Um, you know, especially you know the uh, uh, the 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 uh, organizations that were out there were very active. There's a lot of fraternal organizations, uh, um, other uh, ones that were advocacy type organizations. Um, and, and so um, oftentimes they will have like group photos uh, or photos of their like fraternal lodges and that sort of thing. Um, those are definitely of interest to us here in, in documenting that history and culture. Okay, let me take another look at the chat here, see if there's any other questions here from the audience. So it looks like there's nothing outstanding in the chat. Um, I guess we, um, do we wanna open up to the floor to, for people to ask questions directly? if they so wish. Hmm. I guess we have a bashful bunch tonight. Yes, a very bashful bunch tonight. <laughs> We would love to hear from others too. What exhibits would you like us to pursue? Uh, Stephanie really goes uh, two to three years in advance. So does anyone have any uh, passion or any desire to share with us what they might like to see? Also, I'm gonna ask uh, um, the, the, the group here, uh, how, how many have visited us here in Cedar Rapids? Helen, I know uh, it's been a few years, so we'd like to see you back again. I'll see what I can do. You get the planes uh, more uh, comfortable, and I'll I'll uh, make an effort. I saw Catherine was Catherine was here. She's visited us many times. Tatko. Yes, I, I see you're in the list there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have a really cool uh, sewing machine from her father on. Uh, display in our permanent exhibit. And sometimes we have a, a, a suit, a plaid suit that he sewed. We take it off display sometimes just to protect it from the light. So it kind of goes off and on display. So I think right now it's on display, the suit is, um, along with the sewing machine. It's kind of in our section of um, the kind of jobs that immigrants had when they came to the US. Yeah. Uh, we, do have a, we do have a question in the chat. Um, uh, do you ever do exhibits on food? We were um, planning on doing something on food in the next couple of years. I'm not sure where that project ended up because it's sort of when the pandemic hit, then all of a sudden we weren't in our offices for six weeks, right? When we were starting to talk about this. So we were going to do an exhibit about immigrant food waste. 
Um, so that's probably still coming up in the future, not in 2021. It's not happening this year, but I think that will happen um, in in the next couple of years. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, and I just want to add to that. That's a great question because, uh, as Stephanie said, we we had this, and and we are. It looks like we're going to be doing a film um, next year uh, in 2022 about immigrant foodways. Uh, we um, have some possibilities to do a film on that, uh, but also uh, probably uh, relevant for now is because of the pandemic. We started. Uh, the, although the formal announcement hasn't gone out, but a national Czech and Slovak cooking school, uh, the only one like this in the nation. And we started in uh, June doing uh, online classes in cooking, Czech and Slovak cooking, including Brinzovi Halushki. And uh, the classes are sold out each time. And the students actually make the food with the professor, with the instructor online and show it to each other and talk about it. And we're planning, uh, if all goes right, in July of this year uh, to have a week-long cooking school uh, here in Cedar Rapids on uh, Czech and Slovak cooking. And so, and then they would actually get a certificate sort of modeled after the New Orleans type cooking school. And so uh, that is um, certainly something that that were uh, is in our planning, both short-term and, as Stephanie said, long-term. I saw Karen Varian's name pop up there as, as one of our, um, in our group here. And uh, um, I wanna also point out that, that we do collect Carpathia Rusa materials. We have very little of it in our collection and I wanna see more of that represented here. And that's certainly, you know, uh, um, you know it's a little more uh, uh, hard to find, certainly here in the Midwest, but um, you know, there, there were some uh, uh, outposts in the Chicago area and the and Minneapolis, St. Paul area as well, but, but um, those materials largely reside out east. And so again, um, you know, we would be happy to preserve those, those kind of items in our collection here too. Just want to put a plug in for that. Hey Dave, I see in the chat, there's a question about what is the oldest artifact in the collection. And I, the oldest item is actually a library material, isn't it? Don't you have something that's quite old in the it library? Is. Yeah, we have a, um, it's a, a hymnal. It's a, it's a, in, in old Czech. It's from the um, Czech Brethren era. So I believe it's from uh, uh, 1564. And it is in wonderful collect, uh, condition. It was donated to us by, uh, 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 this somebody from Cedar Rapids area here uh, whose descendants came to America around 1860 and they were they were Czech Protestants and uh, um, th this this thing was passed down through several generations and the donor felt that you know now that the museum had been established uh, um, you know, it was best to have it in the, the you know our hands for future generations so we're very thankful for that uh, the other, another old item is one volume of the Kralitsa Bible series, and that is actually on display in our, uh, in, in our Faces of Freedom exhibit. So, um, and then I would say the oldest materials that we have uh, are probably religious type materials. Um, and so the, um, so those, but the, the oldest one is, I believe, 1564. The oldest actual non-library material, the oldest thing in the artifact collection is from the, the 18th century. So you can see here we are in America. I mean, it's something from the 1700s and it is also a religious artifact. It's a, it's a pottery, it's a painted pottery figure of, um, of Mary and Jesus. Yeah, I can um, also in the chat, uh, a few people have expressed an interest in uh, exhibits from the in future exhibits from the World War I timeframe, uh, and especially with about families that were separated due to the war. So that's a suggestion from the audience. Okay, yeah, we, we have done, uh, for as far as World War I era, we've twice kind of done the legions and the formation of Czechoslovakia, but that's really, that's, that's it. So I'd be happy to look into a sort of a different side to, to that story in the future. And in the library, we do have material about the Czechoslovak Legion as well. And uh, in the original uh, Czech and Slovak, we also have several books about the, uh, uh, um, the Legion and the World War I time period as well. Uh, 
All right, let me look at the chat again, see if there's anything else that's popped up. Okay, it looks like we're all caught up on the chat questions here. Um, I guess uh, I guess we'll give the audience uh, one last chance to uh, ask any questions they they would like. Okay, uh, not seeing any questions here. So, uh, Cecilia, you, um, do you want to wrap things up for us tonight? Well, thank you, Brian, and again, thank you, Helen, and and we'll go back to that last slide one more time, Amanda, uh, because uh, I want to invite each one of you to come and visit us, please. And if you do, and Catherine knows this so well because she's uh, been here. Uh, when you do come, if you say you're with the Slovak Americans. Uh, Society of DC. I promise, I promise to have for you a fresh collage and uh, coffee ready uh, because we that sort of gotten to be our little trademark here. If somebody comes special from out of town, uh, we uh, secretly have these collages stashed away here. And we promise to, to give you just say I'm from the Society in DC and we will be happy to welcome you and to uh, have that coffee and collage ready. Uh, for you. So again, please come and see us. And if you can't come now, join us online and then we'll look forward in good times. And I really want to stress um, for the society the importance of visiting us when we have this Treasures of Slovakia, because this is a really world premiere outside of Slovakia. So we want to uh, really spread the word about that. And um, Cedar Rapids is a lovely place to come in vacation. Believe it or not, we're just three hours from Chicago and we're 25 minutes from the University of Iowa if you're a football fan. And so we do have a lot to offer. We have the Amana colonies, which were settled by Germans uh, and uh, a very large settlement uh, in the Amana colonies. And so there's a lot to see here. And if you're a Dvozhak uh, music aficionado, uh, we're about an hour and a half from where he composed uh, some of his works when he was in America. So uh, definitely it's a place to come and visit uh, and uh, we would love to welcome you with that co-watch, okay? And great, great history connections and, and culture. And this is Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, we can, Catherine. I just want to say, Cecilia does keep her word. The coolach and the coffee is waiting for you. So that was wonderful when we came a couple years ago. So thank you again. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> okay, well, all right. I'm, I'm looking forward to enjoying that too when I come out to visit. So, so I would like to uh, thank uh, Cecilia, Stephanie, and Dave for a, a, a wonderful presentation this evening. And I would like to thank the audience for joining us tonight. And please consider offering your support to the NCSML in the future. So with that, I will wish everyone good night and thank you for joining us. Thank you for hosting. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night. Dobro noc. Dobro noc. Dobro noc.